The plane had landed in a small field in Burwell, a sleepy farming community near Carrollton, Georgia, where nothing major ever happens. Many neighbors witnessed the plane coming down. Bill Jetters and his wife lived in this house at the end of this field, angled directly in the plane's path. My wife was sitting at the kitchen table reading. And uh, she said, Bill, we better get out of here because the plane's going to hit the house. So uh, about that time, it started stopping. I said, well, you call 911, and I'm going to see if I can help at the plane. Yes, we have a plane crashed in our backyard. A plane crashed? Yes, somebody out here currently. Eight minutes had passed since First Officer Warmerdam had declared an emergency and asked Atlanta Center for rescue vehicles to be alerted. But the controller hadn't passed on the message. Minutes would make the difference now between life and death. The local emergency services responded quickly but were still many miles away. For almost a minute after impact, there's an eerie silence. The plane fuselage is broken in two. Could anyone survive? As the dust settles, <coughs> all 29 people on board are miraculously alive, with only a handful seriously injured by the impact. It was an amazing situation only because uh, I just couldn't even believe that I was alive at that point, and I couldn't believe uh, that I was looking at something that, uh, that was real. But a new disaster is gathering. Fuel from the shattered wing tanks is pouring onto the ground. The last thing I remember is, is the sound of hitting the trees and then I honestly don't recall impact. Captain Ed Ganaway has been knocked unconscious by a blow to the head during the impacts. When First Officer Matt Warmerdam regains consciousness, he realizes they're stuck. The cockpit door is jammed and smoke is slowly seeping in. He reaches for the emergency crash ax. The cockpit window is the only way out. The next immediate thought I had was now we're gonna blow up. So get out of there. It was burning, you know, right in the opening. You know, so I just jumped over. And I headed towards the opening and I walked out of the aircraft and I walked away from it. The sparks ignite the fuel vapors, creating a blazing fire. Within seconds, the fire spreads to the fuselage. In the rear section of the plane, the passengers are now trapped by flames burning at 1,800 degrees centigrade. They can hear screams from the field outside where some passengers are already suffering from terrible burns. To escape, they too have to run through the fire, not fall in it, hoping for the best. I turned back and I looked at the aircraft and what I saw was that the opening that I had come through was basically fully engulfed in flames and that the people that were exiting the aircraft were all on fire. Some of them would, you know, roll in the grass to try and put the fire out. And sometimes that uh, made it worse because there was spent or spilt fuel. And then they would get even more ignited. And the whole situation got uglier and uglier in the sense that it, you would all of a sudden see people with their clothing burned off. You would see people with, 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 uh, with red, uh, red skin that you could see was burnt. You could actually see some people whose flesh uh, was like dropping off of their bodies or their faces. Um, it, it, was, it was just a horrible situation that was taking place and it was getting worse and worse. <laughs> Matt Warmerdam, his right shoulder dislocated, is banging the axe against the window with his left hand. The 
person's uh, clothes were on fire and she was on the ground. I think it was a woman. She was on the ground and Robin uh, said to me, she says, uh, take off your shirt, take off your pants, try to beat the flames out. And I did that. One gentleman I saw was uh, crawling, completely engulfed in flames. And another one that was, uh, most of his clothes was torn off. Now, whether they got torn off in the crash or uh, he tore them off himself, I don't know. I helped him away from the airplane and brought him up towards my brother-in-law's house. And uh, all he had on was his shorts and uh, his skin was, uh, excuse me. Well, being a paralyzed person myself, I knew that I couldn't do much for them. I was looking and I thought to myself, well, that'll be the, these people that are on that airplane are seeing the last seconds of a normal life that they'll ever live. Aircraft glass is much thicker than what you would see on like, a, like an automobile windshield. It's uh, several different composite layers that have been temper treated together to make it a very, very tough surface. And with each swing of the crash axe, I was only able to chip away a small piece of glass. I need some help! I really did feel kind of alone there. I'm looking around left and right, and there's, there's no other fools that close, you know, I, at that second. But even though passenger David McCorkle believes that the plane might blow up at any second, he goes to Matt Warmerdam's rescue. Can you help me? I haven't got enough room inside to swing it. Uh, right. Right. In here. Uh, uh, oh. Hang on a second here. Hang on, I gotta get some air. The oxygen cylinder in the closet behind the co-pilot's seat punctures. It'll make the cockpit fire much worse. Okay. Uh, go ahead, go ahead. Okay. Uh, stop a second! Let me see if I can squeeze that. Uh, 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 oh, let's get you no, out no, of here. No, stop pulling me! No, no, it's too small. Go ahead. Uh, by now, the rescue crews of the area have been notified. Firemen, police officers, paramedics, all are hurriedly on their way to the crash site. Will the fire trucks arrive in time to save Matt Warmerdam before the cockpit gets engulfed in flames? David McCorkle is exhausted trying to break the strong glass. Suddenly, a heat flame pops at him from below the cockpit. He backs off, scared for his life. You aren't gonna let me die, are you? He has children, and he must think of them as well. How can he sacrifice his life for a man he does not know? Now more determined than ever, he bangs even harder and faster. Then suddenly, the weakened axe head flies off. It's getting hot in here! Get me out! Guy Pope, a police officer, is the first rescue worker to reach the burning plane. I was about three miles from here when I received the call. And about halfway here, I could see the smoke, pretty heavy smoke. And I got out of the car, and I ran up to the plane. And when I went around the nose of the plane, uh, one of the passengers handed me a hatchet uh, and said that the pilot was inside. And uh, I took the hatchet and uh, started trying to cut a bigger hole. I couldn't get around behind the cockpit because of the fire. It was still burning pretty heavy, and there was an oxygen bottle there blowing the fire. And, uh, you know, it, it's just one of them things. You, you, you see a man burn, uh, you, it's, you don't forget it. This is live footage taken with a video from the windshield of a Georgia State Patrol police car as rescue workers are arriving at the site. At this moment, all passengers are out of the two sections of the broken plane, 
except pilots Ed Ganaway and Matt Warmerdam, who remain prisoners of their cockpit. Well, first off, I had to tear the back of the cockpit out. It had burnt, and there was no door, or visible door, or anything like that. So I actually took my hands and tore it out. When I started to pull him out, he looked up and he said, tell my wife, Amy, that I love her. I said, no, sir, you tell her that you love her, because I'm getting you out of here. Inside the ambulance, I worked with him, and I thought that probably he would not make it. I took his name badge and pinned it on his underwear, which was the only thing I'd left on him, trying to cool him down, because I thought that if he died, at least someone would know who he was. Surprisingly, Matt was aware of everything around him, and he kept trying to assure me that things were going to be OK. He was comforting me, because at that particular time, I was crying. Matthew actually took his burned hand and wiped a tear away. They found Captain Ganaway dead in the cockpit. He had struck his head on impact and never regained consciousness. He died of burns and smoke inhalation. The crash survivors, some with broken bones and others with burns ranging from minor to 92%, are rushed to various hospitals in Georgia. 13 passengers were brought to Tanner Hospital in Carrollton, 15 minutes away, where code black was immediately applied, meaning everybody helps. Dr. Bobby Mitchell, after working a night shift, was awakened. He was responsible for treating four survivors, including flight attendant Robin Feck. When I got to the hospital, some of the people uh, that had survived the plane crash were, were already here. The smell was initially just a wave of uh, jet fuel that just hit you as the door opened, and then that was mixed with just a pungent, uh, horrible odor of burned flesh. Ms. Feck, she had a cut on her scalp and uh, a couple of broken bones, like a collarbone and an arm. And she was in a great deal of pain herself, although she, she didn't particularly want me to be dealing with her. She said, you get back with them. And the orthopedist soon took over her care. She was clearly still trying to care for her passengers. When a a patient suffers a severe burn, the skin is violated, and the skin really is the major part of your immune system. So people that have been horribly burned, that, that initial defense is violated, and infection, infectious organisms, organisms harmful to the body can very easily get in, and your immune system can just handle so much. When they are able to survive for a period of weeks, it is not uncommon for them to die from other organ failure, which is what happened to a lot of the people that were on Flight 529. I have never before or since dealt with so much um, physical devastation and emotional upheaval and so much sorrow and horror and sadness in one place at one time than, than we did on that day in this, this little small town hospital. After a long day treating the horribly burned passengers and witnessing the courage of some of them, Dr. Mitchell was asked to assist the autopsy on Captain Ed Ganaway. I looked down at him and kind of put my hand over on, I told everybody, I, thought, I hope wherever his spirit is that he knows what a good job he did. And, and I just said, you know, you're the hero. I hope you know it, Captain Ganaway. Regional airlines are a North American phenomenon. In the early 1960s, a small band of independent airlines first became known as air taxis, which in time became commuter airlines, then finally regional airlines. In 1978, the US deregulated the airlines, and as the small and mid-sized cities became the economic engine of the country, regional airlines prospered as never before. The National Transportation Safety Board in the United States is responsible for investigating air disasters. Its GO team is on duty 24 hours a day to fly to the scene of any major crash. The NTSB will have several subgroups working at the same time, each examining a particular part of the plane. Gordon Jim Hookey, an aerospace engineer, was in charge of the propeller maintenance group. We went out to the crash site, and in the usual fashion, um, you just kind of look around and get a feel for where all the pieces are. We came along the um, propeller assembly that was missing, looking down through the dirt, we could see the telltale marks, the beach marks 
around along the fracture surface that indicated it might have been a fatigue fracture. During the last 10 minutes of flight 529, no one on board the plane suspected that the engine failure had been caused by a propeller blade fracture. Hookie had good reason to be concerned by the broken propeller blade. He'd seen it all before. Four years earlier, another ASA Brasilia had nosedived and crashed in woods in Georgia, killing all 23 people aboard, including former US Senator John Tower of Texas and space shuttle astronaut Manly Sonny Carter. The NTSB's investigation of that incident had found the crash had been caused by a badly designed propeller control unit, and they blamed the manufacturer, Hamilton Standard. Then in March 1994, just 17 months before ASA 529, on two separate commercial flights, identical propeller blades broke from metal fatigue over Canada and over Brazil. In both cases, the aircraft involved managed to land safely. These accidents pointed to serious problems in Hamilton's standard propellers and became a major crisis for the company. Airlines were ordered by the government to carry out an inspection of all the 15,000 propeller blades in service. Investigators found that the broken propeller had been declared suspect and sent back to Hamilton Standard for inspection. When the ASA mechanics took the, um, the blade off the, the hub, as soon as they turned it over, we marked down uh, the serial number. So when we went back to do the records, we could immediately go to that particular blade. Investigator Jim Hookie took the broken blade stub to Atlanta Airport. From there, it was sent to the NTSB laboratory in Washington. By next morning, blade number 861398 was being examined under a scanning microscope. Investigators found telltale deposits of chlorine, a corrosive substance known to eat into the inner walls of the propeller blade. So then the question becomes, um, where did the chlorine come from? In two of the previous propeller failures, the problem had also been traced to corrosion caused by chlorine in the inner wall of the blade. Flight 529's blade had also snapped off 13.2 inches from the hub, very similar to the two previous blade failures. Under the microscope, NTSB scientists saw that two cracks along the inner wall of the blade had joined to form a single fissure. This had grown and grown until it circled the blade, at which point it snapped under the stress of normal operation. But the NTSB scientists noted something else. On the inner surface, extending about one and a half inches from the fracture, there was a series of sanding marks. Hookie set off to Hamilton Standard, intent on getting the maintenance records for the propellers. What had been done to the blade when it had been recalled? At the factory, Hookie examined the blade's repair reports. He noted the initials of the technician who did the work, CSB, Christopher Scott Bender. He was a young technician who worked at a Hamilton Standard propeller repair facility. Christopher Bender had watched the news of the accident on television, little realizing how he was involved in the accident. I saw the Hamilton Standard prop on it, and I was like, I hope this is not a prop failure. Uh, it was just kind of the back of my mind, and in that morning they were like, you know, the NTSB is down there, FAA is investigating, uh, and they've called in some of our engineers to go also down there, and it, it might be a prop failure. Uh, and as soon as I heard that, my heart just sank, because I was like, you know, I, I think I might have even cried a little bit, because I was just, you know, just emotionally overwhelmed that, you know, something I had put my hands on, the procedure that somebody trusted me to do failed. Uh, and because that somebody had died. After discovering the technician who had last worked on the propeller blade that caused the crash of ASA 529, the NTSB now had to find out how the blade had passed inspection. Propeller blades are hollow. Inside, weights are inserted to balance the prop. They're kept in place by a cork soaked in chlorine. It was the chlorine that had caused the corrosion in the previous accidents. However, on this blade, Bender had been unable to detect any evidence of corrosion. He then did what he'd been told to do, polish the inside of the blade. The draft accident report we present to you today involves Atlantic Southeast Airlines Flight 529. An the NTSB found that by polishing the blade, Hamilton Standard had unwittingly removed all traces of the crack, and a later, more thorough ultrasound examination couldn't detect it. The NTSB asked for more accountability for management at Hamilton Standard. And so the final report read, 
The fracture was caused by a fatigue crack from multiple corrosion pits that were not discovered by Hamilton Standard because of inadequate and ineffective corporate inspection and repair techniques, training, documentation and communications. Some final questions still needed to be answered. Why had the broken propeller blade destroyed the engine? In previous incidents, the entire propeller had fallen away harmlessly. But on flight 529, blade loss unbalanced the propeller and led to uncontrollable high-speed shaking as the engine shuddered in its mountings. This was the ominous hammering sound heard by the passengers. It literally ripped the engine open and left the useless propeller jammed against the wing. The flight crew weren't handling the engine failure as a, a true engine failure in that some mechanical malfunction occurred and the engine stopped running. They didn't know that the engine actually had vibrated significantly and broken from its mount and actually canted or twisted on the wing. The NTSB found that the rescue services might have arrived more quickly if controllers had heeded Matt Warmerdam's request for help on the ground, given by radio six and a half minutes before the crash. Another key NTSB recommendation was to replace the flimsy crash axe that had failed in Warmerdam's rescue with a sturdier model. Investigators praised the crew of Flight 529 for the way they dealt with the crisis, calling their reactions reasonable and appropriate. But the board could offer little advice on the one thing that had caused all these deaths, fire. The conundrum is, how do you make a fuel burn in an engine but not ignite when it's spilled? One way to reduce the severity of post-crash fires is by utilizing less flammable fuel. In 1984, the Federal Aviation Administration and NASA decided to test a new, safer fuel by staging an accident using a remote control plane. Unfortunately, it was not a conspicuous success. But the US Navy has been using a safer form of jet fuel called JP-5 since the 1950s, yet it's not used in commercial aviation. The primary reason that uh, civilian sector commercial aviation has not gone to a lower flammability fuel is a question of availability and distribution and the cost. It costs more to produce the JP-5. Everything comes down to money. What's it going to cost to develop a system? What's it going to cost to implement the system? What's it going to do for the overall safety of the airplane and who's going to pay for it? Personally, from a safety standpoint, I'll pay $2 extra in my ticket to know and to have that security. Until a solution is found, there will continue to be stories like ASA 529. On impact, everyone on this flight had survived, but the subsequent fire became the killer. For the victims of the fire, recovery has been a slow, painful, and excruciating process. First Officer Matt Warmerdam was burned on 42% of his body. Some other survivors suffered up to 90% burns. Treatment included daily baths and removal of dead skin from burn wounds. There would be years of skin graft operations, the 24-hour-a-day wearing of pressure garments to minimize scarring, chronic itching and soreness, and daily physical therapy. Your ability to sense and feel through those areas is permanently changed uh, for the worse. Temperature control uh, is lost. When you walk from an air-conditioned building into the outside, you take for granted that your body starts accommodating that either by sweating or redirecting blood flow. People with burns, especially horrible, large surface area burns, that's lost forever. They have to plan everything they do. They have to plan where they're going to be and the clothing much more carefully. So there are emotional and physical things both that are lost forever. My medical treatments were quite extensive. Um, I think I'm, I honestly have lost count how many surgeries I had to go through to, to get back to the point where I could fly again, but it's got to be somewhere near 50, um, I including all the skin grafting things that they had to do in the hospital and, and as such. Psychologically, it was, was tough in the beginning. Um, there I was, uh, happy to be finally starting my career as I had dreamed it from my childhood and it was suddenly ripped away. And that was tough. There was a lot of uh, long nights talking with Amy, um, 
trying to get over the, the, the pain and despair of all that. I did have trouble getting my life back in order. Uh, it caused me to drink more than uh, more than I had before. I think it, the plane crash, it just took the last bite. And I stayed in the fire service for a while after that, but my heart was never in it again. I quit my job as I was a vice president of a software company, traveling a lot, um, making very good money. And I went to work as a buyer in Alaska. I also reconnected with uh, my ex-wife, and we got remarried, moved down to South Carolina, and had all our kids move in with us. So yeah, I, I did change my life. It helped me to kind of put a lot of things in perspective, including not only how I acted myself, but also how I treated other people. One year after the crash, the Military Fraternal Organization of Pilots bestowed its prestigious medallion on Matt Warmadam for his part in saving the lives of his passengers. He accepted it in honor of the crew. Seeking closure on the trauma of the crash, residents built a memorial to the victims of Flight 529 behind Shiloh United Methodist Church, a short distance from the accident site in Burwell. You know, I wish this had never happened. I wish I could go back in time and, and fix it and take care of it, that it didn't happen. You know, I don't know if they believe in God or not, but I, I, I pray for them that God comforts them uh, through the hurt that they've had in their lives. Much has changed for the company that manufactured Flight 529's propeller. Now renamed Hamilton Sunstrand, it's part of the giant United Technologies Aerospace and Defense Group. Flight 529 was the last time that one of its propellers failed in flight. Its inspection and repair process was made more stringent, in some cases exceeding FAA requirements. Since the three blade failures, there have been none whatsoever. Of the 29 people aboard ASA Flight 529, only eight escaped with minor injuries. Of the 21 others who received major injuries and burns, 10 subsequently died. Flight attendant Robin Feck declined to be interviewed for this film. Still suffering from the pain and anguish of that terrible day, she's never worked as a flight attendant again. The best thing I ever could have done for myself was that day two years ago when I'd finished training and took the controls of a ASA plane and flew again. I stubbornly recaptured my dream. And now that I'm doing it again, it's, it's just been a joy. It's what I do, it's what I love. It's what I always wanted to do with my life, and I'm doing it again.